Good morning, Bay Hills Church. I want to welcome you. I welcome you here today. And we're going to stand up on our feet if you can. Online campus. Yo, let's give it a God praise today. He's worthy of all the praise. Amen. Come on. Help me see this out this morning. a seat. Um, and before you do, actually, why don't you go ahead and say hello to someone seated near, nearby.
Excellent, excellent. Church, well, I, I am so excited to be with you this morning. Uh, I just want to take a moment to let you know about some of the things that are happening here at the church. So the first is, uh, if you have in your bulletin, you should have gotten a little connection card. If you would take just a few moments, fill that out. What that does is it helps us to get your information so that we can keep you updated on all the things that are happening here at the church. Uh, the second thing that I want to draw your attention to is in the back, over by the exit on the left side, we have what is called our next steps center and here at bay hills our mission is to help everyone take their next step closer to jesus but for some of us that might be a little bit intimidating like i'm not really sure exactly what my next step looks like well we have a team of people that are back there who are ready to help you determine exactly what the next right step is for you we also have two things that are coming up one is our fall fest come on church get excited we're just one week away Man, I cannot wait for this event. It's the perfect opportunity. If you've got kids <laughs> and somebody back there is really excited too, I'll give you a hint. It's Alan. Alan is very excited about Fall Fest and for good reason, right? We're going to have games. We're going to have prizes. We're going to have all sorts of fun activities. So uh, I encourage you, bring your kids, but also take a moment to invite someone from your community, maybe someone that isn't involved in church, and this could be their first step uh, towards getting to know Jesus. Uh, and so we believe that it is essential for us to uh, have an impact locally, but we also believe that Bay Hills uh, needs to make an impact globally. And so that is why we have Operation Christmas Child. We are partnering with them uh, to prepare boxes that we're going to send to kids uh, who come from underprivileged communities. And so this is a great opportunity uh, even to just have like a teaching moment with your kid. I remember growing up, my mom would help me to pack these. And I thought, well, mom, why can't I have the soccer ball? <laughs> why can't I have the stuff that we're putting? Because I'm selfish, obviously. Um, and then she would explain to me in that moment, hey, this is not for you. This is our opportunity to give to somebody else. And so this is a really beautiful thing. We also have one more thing that is coming up today, right here, right now. And so what I'm going to ask, would you put your hands together as Josh uh, and some folks work their way up to the stage? We're going to have a moment of child dedications. Well, good morning, Bay Hills. How are you guys doing? Good. So you guys want to go right here? And I'll have you guys hit. Um, so my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors around here. And today, what we're going to do is, is a little bit of family business. Um, so are we family around here, Bay Hills? I, I hope we are. I hope we're family around here. Um, and I, I just want to share with you um, what's going on on this stage right now. It's nothing magical, but it is something that is spectacular in terms of what these folks are, are wanting to do, which is to dedicate their kids. Um, dedication, we learn basically from what Moses told the Israelites uh, when they were headed into the promised land. He told them this, uh, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. And so that's what they're doing on this stage. They want, what they're basically doing is they're, they're telling everyone, we want to try and point our kiddos towards Jesus. As best as we possibly can, we want them to follow Christ. But here's the, the rub, and here's what Moses was actually really saying is this. Repeat these commands that I'm giving you again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Who has kids in here? Raise your hand if you have kids. Is it, is it, is that easy? Is it, is it easy to continually point them in the right direction? No, I heard it. I heard it. I have a kid and it's hard. And that's why what Moses was actually telling them to do is that he wasn't just telling the family to, to do this, the, the, the unit, the mom, the dad, or the, the aunt, or the uncle. He was telling all of us. He was telling all of us as a church family that what we're to do is we're to support these families and lift them up as they help point their kids towards Jesus. And that's, that's our challenge. That's our challenge as a church. So I want to encourage you in that. That as they're standing up here and they're saying, I want to point my, t my kids towards Christ, they're not alone in this. They need you. They need all of us. So I'm going to let them, uh, they've prepared some prayers over their, their kids, so I'm going to let them kind of take the show now. Um, so who, go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Hi, I'm Reese. Okay, this is Reese, and who are we dedicating today? Uh, this is Malia. Okay, Malia. So you have a prayer uh, prepared? Yes. Um, Heavenly Father, first giving honor to you. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. 
Thank you for also giving a, gifting us with Malia. I want to take a moment to thank you for her village, our family and friends that go above and beyond to support me and Malia. I could have never imagined that after birthing her in China, she would be so, surrounded with so much love, wisdom, and support. I pray that me and her father are given the tools to teach, provide, and support Malia on the path that only you have created for her. I pray that we never lose sight of that in spite of what either of us may have in mind for her. Thank you for opening our hearts and showing us love, a love like no other. We pray that Malia will serve you faithfully with her whole heart, devoted to you all the days of her life. Please continue to protect her, and may she always find comfort in knowing who you are and what you can do for her. I, I look forward to seeing her grow more and more in love with you. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you, Reese. Okay, so who's, uh, who's doing the reading over here? Sure, I'm Katrina, and uh, this is my husband, Joel. Oh, and uh, this is Lily and Mia. <laughs> um, God, we thank you for Lily and Mia. We thank you for the joy and laughter they bring us each day. We thank you for the way they challenge us to grow as parents and as husband and wife. Today, we are proclaiming to our church, our family's devotion to you, Lord, that our greatest goal as parents is that Lily and Mia believe in you and come to know you. We ask you for your continued favor over them. May you guide them each day, and may they always remember your presence in both good and bad times. Let their lives be a testament to your goodness and your grace. Amen. Amen. Let's give these guys a hand. Go ahead and have a seat here. We'll, we'll take it. We've got one more family that we want to invite into the stage as these guys are, are heading out. We've, we've got some, some kiddos and some adults are coming up. And, and I've got the privilege of welcoming someone else onto the stage, um, Linda Castillo, who um, has been involved with the church for a very long time, and she has prepared something she's going she's gonna to share for this family. Today we're going to have the privilege of dedicating Brandy's twins, these two little guys, Elias and Ezra, and she will be describing why her and her husband had picked these names. But she had asked for a verse that would come before her, and um, with the raising of, of all of these children, and this is for you, and this is for you, for you, okay? Don't be afraid, for I am with you, God says. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you today dedicating my boys to you, Elias Reed and Ezra Davis. Like the meanings of their names, God's strength and God's helper, may they fulfill that promise here on earth, showing and being an example of you. May they also find endless strength during their lives and know that they can always turn to you for help. I pray, I shout, and I call unto you, God, that although these boys weren't given the chance to know their earthly father, and the example he would have been to them, that they will have God's community and the people you send to help mentor, lead, teach, and remind them that they have a heavenly father who will always be there, who will never leave them nor forsake them, who gives them a hope for a future, and who will always love them. God, I thank you for blessing me with these two boys. I know, God, you have entrusted me to raise them and the way they should go. I pray for your guidance, and on this parenting journey alone, help me always to remember that they are not just my child, but ultimately yours, and I'm privileged to be raising a child of God. Please go before me and pave the way for this journey. I thank you for everything that you've been given to me, and I just ask that you set and prepare the rooms that these boys will enter as they will change the world. And I pray, Lord, um, and I ask, Lord, that they will just touch lives. Amen. Amen. As we, um, 
As we close out our time, um, we are family. And so as you feel led, I want to just ask you to stand real quick to, to, or to lift out a hand. We're going to just bless these family. Linda, would you just pray for us as we close out our, our child dedications? Father God, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. We thank you that you call us to family. And Father, our family here at Bay Hills is here to come alongside each of these families. I pray, Father, that we will just engage, that we will insert ourselves into their lives, and that, Father, you will provide each of these parents profound wisdom, discernment, joy, encouragement, and Father, I pray that, Father, you, you meet their needs and that, Father, that um, you go before them, stand beside them, and hold them when they stand still. We thank you in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to invite you guys to continue to stand with me as we continue worship. was my cross you bore now i could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and i will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name.
want to go forward without you, Lord God. So be with us through the service, Jesus. All throughout. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What's up? How you doing? You're all weirded out by that introduction, aren't you? You're like, can you do something a little more holy, a little more spiritual? Uh, you you got some people who are like, no, please don't do that. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know where to go after last week, okay? I feel like everything is downhill after last week, so I'm going to resign as of now. Uh, uh, because I, I don't know, that was, that was intense, right? Wasn't that intense? I mean, it was intense. So I don't know what to do. Uh, and part of the reason is, is, you know, I'm Gen X, and so, like, like we lived on experience, right? Uh, Gen, X, Gen X, my generation, who came of age particularly in the late 80s to the mid-90s, uh, they're, they're, in my opinion, they're a dangerous generation. They were the, they were the like, somebody came to me, and they were like, hey, uh, did you see that Ma- Mark Wahlberg thing? And I was like, Mark Wahlberg, who? I know Marky Mark. I, I don't know Mark Wahlberg. I just know who Marky Mark. I know about the Funky Bunch, but I don't know Mark. Who's this Mark Wahlberg you're talking about? My generation introduced grunge to the world. We were the original emo. We were the original depressed generation. Except we did it through song, and that was gangster. All right. Uh, we introduced the form of hip hop. We introduced. Uh, uh, shows and media uh, like Seinfeld and Friends. We introduced the Tamagotchi toy to an entire generation of children. If you don't know what that is, yo, man, you just, right? Uh, we, we, we introduced the at-home video game, my generation, which I'm not sure I really like that. Yeah, I mean, Atari's, Nintendo was a game changer, no pun intended. I mean, no pun intended. Right? Uh, we, we gave you the Macarena. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Weddings would never be the same after that. Amen? Uh, uh, we, we had iconic figures like Kurt Cobain, movies like The Matrix, and Hold Me, Leo. Uh, it was like three people got the Titanic reference. That's it. Oh my gosh, this, this, I just, that was like an iceberg joke. All right, uh, but my generation was, <laughs> my, listen, my generation was also the latchkey generation, though, which, which was basically this. Uh, your mom and I are going to work. Here's a key. Go straight home after school. Protect the home. Try not to die. We'll be home at some point in the middle of the night. See you then. Uh, what do we do about food? Figure it out, Nancy. There's a whole kitchen full of stuff and cupboard full of stuff. Get to work. And we were just like, what? Like if I did that to my kids in their generation, they would die. They would starve. There was no chance, okay? But that was Gen X. On the weekends, get out. We don't want to see you anymore. When the street lights come on, you better be within earshot. That was my generation, Okay. Go, try not to get murdered, kidnapped, molested. Just go. We're not going to be there to protect you, so I hope you're good with sticks and rocks, okay? That's my generation. (laughs) So stupid. Uh, My generation, because of the fact that parents were never home, was was the generation of cheap substitutes. Cheap fixes. Like, I don't know how, like, I, people all the time are like, oh, I got to stay home from work today because the plumber's coming. What? That did not happen when I was young. It was like, 
I got to go to work, so wrap some duct tape around that thing, and it'll be good for a month until I can figure this out. That's how we got things done. We fixed it ourselves. We had to find a way to make it. To, we, got the, we were MacGyver's generation. For, you have it in your home somewhere. Figure it out. Which means we were the pioneers of this thing. Or at least we certainly were purveyors. The paper plate. Sometimes it was made of plastic. Sometimes styrofoam. We didn't really care about the environment. We were just trying to eat, y'all, all all right? Uh, We were trying to eat. We did not have... So the reason we did paper plates was because uh, parents were never home, uh, and it was, and nobody wanted to do dishes when they did get home. Nobody did. So put it on, we put everything on a paper plate, and then we just threw it away. The, it, but here, here's the problem, though. Paper plate is not durable, it's not sustainable, and it's not enjoyable to eat with. It's not durable, but it is disposable, which means it's less work right? But, but it's delicate. You, you put spaghetti on the wrong paper plate, you're going to be eating spaghetti off the counter. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not sustainable. It's practical, meaning it's convenient, but, but it's not going to last. Nobody rewashes their paper plates. And if you are doing that, stop it. That's ghetto, man. I mean, that's just straight ghetto. Please don't do that. Okay, it's, (laughs) come on, yeah, I got to get there. It's economical, but it is not enjoyable. There's this uh, Mexican place next to my house, and they have my favorite enchiladas, and and sometimes we have them delivered. When they deliver them, they deliver them on a paper plate covered in foil, and so the first few times I tried to eat off this thing with a knife and a fork, I would like, uh, the fork would come up with like flakes of foil and paper plate. And I would be like, oh no, this is not how this is going to work. So then from now on, I just scooped it off the plate onto a regular plate because a regular plate is usually bigger and it's more enjoyable for me to eat off of, okay? I just don't like eating off of a paper plate in general, okay? And... So paper plates are not durable, not sustainable, not joy-producing. Now, we had everything in the cabinets as kids. We had everything we needed to have an enjoyable dinner. But we settled for cheap. I mean, in fact, not only do we have everything in the cabinet, my mother had in another room of the house the fine china cabinet, which I don't know why we had that thing. I just would walk into that room as a child, and I would just stare at it, just thinking, one day, one day, one day we'll eat a, I don't know who, maybe we're waiting for Marky Mark to come over. Maybe the princess die. I don't know. Uh, but we never ate off of that. We just stared at it the whole time and settled for cheap. just like all of y'all with your happiness. I, I, I know real plates are more work, but they're durable, sustainable, and enjoyable. J- joy requires an investment of work to get the necessary requisite perspective so that it's durable, and sustainable, and enjoyable. And we all just settle for this. That's what we do. Paul, as our, in our final chapter of the book of Philippians in our series, in chapter 4, towards the end, he says this. At the moment, so that's Greek present tense. He's talking about today. At this exact moment, And where is he again? How many of y'all remember? He's in prison. I have all I, what's the word? 
Do you believe? And my job is by the end of this morning to get you to believe. That do you have everything you need today? You have everything you need in the kitchen. It'll take a little more work for your joy to be more durable, sustainable, and enjoyable. Do you, you have everything you need at this moment. That's what Paul is saying. Perspective takes more work. It takes more investment, but it won't be a cheap fix. And the result of that investment in Galatians 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. I mean, when you become a Christian, one of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. What was number two? Joy is the result of your investment not in cheap fixes, but in kingdom of investments into your joy. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about three cheap fixes that we tend to go towards, three better investments that I'm going to call us to, that the scriptures are going to call us to, and hopefully by the end of this thing, you will be as convinced as I am, as Paul is, as Jesus is, that at this moment, you have everything you need to leave here with joy today. Amen? Amen. I've got three points. How many? Three. Turn with me to the book of Philippians. That's page 1075 if you're using one of our Bibles. And in verse 6, he opens up our time together by saying this. Don't worry about anything. You say what? Paul... Do you have any idea of what it's like to be a real human being? Sometimes I feel like Paul's a robot. Uh, what is worry? Worry is, we worry about anything that we perceive to threaten our joy. Let me say it again. What produces worry? Anytime we think something that brings us joy is threatened, that's when worry shows up. And so it's, a, it's the reason he opens with, because in this room, there is a lot of worry, anxiety, stress, and fear. Because in this room, there are a lot of you, many of you, that have your joy being threatened right now at work, at school, at home, in your relationship, financially, practically, circumstantially. There are a lot of happenings right now that are producing your worry, stress, anxiety, and fear. So he just says, don't worry. Can you imagine? Well, here's the cheap fix. How do we not worry? This is the cheap fix that we settle for. Distract your heart. Distract your heart. There's two ways we do that, by masking or by managing our problems. Let's start with the first. Uh, Bay Hills, don't think about the color blue. What are you doing right now? Don't you love it when somebody comes along and says, don't worry about that? Well, I wasn't until you said that. <laughs> now I'm worried. Now I'm terrified of that thing. Uh, or maybe somebody has said to you, hey, uh, don't think about that. Just don't worry about it. And you're like, or, or maybe you've said to yourself, I need a distraction. You ever say that? I need a distraction from this problem, from this worry. And distractions tend to fall into one of five categories for us, Bay Hills. Number one, tasks. Some of you, when, when you start to feel stress, anxiety, fear, or worry, here's what you do. You start doing things. You start fixing things. You start organizing things. You start cleaning things. This is my category. My wife and I, literally, when we get into an argument, I will start cleaning the kitchen. I will start putting things away. I will start organizing. As we're arguing, I'm cleaning and organizing. Because if, and, and so now my wife picks a lot more fights. Because... Uh, <laughs> I was like, why, why are you picking this fight right now? She's like, Ma, just keep wiping. We'll talk more about it in a minute. Uh, do you know why we do that? Because if we can't put this fear in order, we'll put this kitchen in order, this garage in order. If I can't fix this problem, I'll fix this thing. Tasks, number two. People, family, friends, 
sexual exploits. These are all the, th you use people to distract you from your problems, worries, stress, anxieties, and fear. You go out with the girls, you go out with the boys, you go see a friend, you go over to their house, and it's not to get through the thing that you're, that you're worried about, it's to distract you from it. Tasks, people, screens. Some of you, when you really start getting stressed, you're like, I'm going to get through this Netflix, this Netflix queue today. We're going we're gonna to get through this whole thing today. And Amazon, and Hulu, Disney Plus. I'm going to subscribe to HBO Max right now. I need more distractions. Or you just scroll on your screen to infinity and beyond watching cat videos or TikTok recreations, right? That's all you do. You're just like, hmm. Wait, Kanye West changed his name to what? Right? You just go. You're just, you're just scrolling. Task people, screens, substances. I don't want you to hear this wrong. But some of you are using substances to quiet your stress and worry in a way that you know is overkill right now at this season of your life. You're using alcohol, weed, or some other substance, and you're depending on that thing to suppress the anxiety, fear, stress, and worry. And then the last category is exits. I'll just, when the relationship gets hard and stresses me out, I'll leave. When the job gets hard, I'll quit. Don't hear me wrong, I don't want you staying in toxic environments, but, but my generation is responsible for raising an entire generation that is told, if it doesn't make you happy, quit. And that's not kingdom thinking. It's not perspective thinking. Maybe you're not masking your problems, but you're managing your problems. Some of you, as soon as you think there's a problem, you're like, I can fix it. And you switch into control mode. And you think that if I can just control enough people or environments, my kids, my job, my, my spouse, whatever, I can just control them. If I can get them to do it my way, if I can get them to all get on board, if I can get them to do it in the way that I've asked them to do it, then I can stop the thing from happening that I'm worried about. I can change it. All right, let's play this out for a second. Bay Hills, pretend right now, go through your list of all the things that you're worried about. Everything at work, go ahead, in your mind. Everything at home, marriage, finances, kids, health. I mean, everything you're worried about. I want you to, in your brain, make a mental visual list of it all. How long, how long is that list? Pretty long? Okay. Let's say if you control enough, you can knock out half of it which you can't, but let's pretend you can control enough variables that half of that stuff you can knock off your list so you don't have to worry about it anymore. You still, you, you done worrying? No, why not? There's another half of the list. And even if you could in some never ending story kind of, I'm saying how many 90s references I can come up with. In some, in some imaginary place, you could knock off the whole list. Something else will show up. You can't manage it. You can't control it. You remember this emotions chart from a few weeks ago? And the re fear, you know why I like the Bible? The Bible has limits your language when you try and expand it, and it expands your language when you try and limit it. So for example, the Bible only recognizes one word, fear. We have anxiety, stress, nervous, right? Because we never want to say that we're afraid, because that's, that's language of weakness in our generation. And then, at the other, and then it tries to expand our language when we try and limit it. So, for example, we say, I love my mom and I love these new pair of jeans. The Bible has four words for love to try and expand you into better language. I love, love, love the Bible for that reason. Fear is an emotion 
that is about future tense control. There's something happening out there. I'm afraid of what will happen, and so I, tr- I can't control it. That's what produces the fear. So it makes sense that one of the ways that we try and manage worry is by controlling harder. So what's the better investment? Paul says in Philippians 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for what he's done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Or maybe you remember it in this translation, it's the peace that transcends understanding. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The better investment is not to distract your heart. If you want joy, direct it. First, in posture, right? He says, be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for what you've been given. Thank, he's in prison. No, Paul is trying to, in the middle of hard circumstances, he's trying to direct the posture of his heart away from distraction and back towards the gospel, back towards Jesus, back towards the Lord, We just believe that the threat to our happiness, the threat to our joy is out there. And Paul is saying in this verse, it's in here. The threat to your joy is not out there. The threat to all of your joy is in here. He's trying to get us to stop working from our circumstances to our happiness and from our joy to our circumstances. He's trying to reverse it. In fact, Psalm 51 says this, create in me a right heart, God. Create in me a right heart, O God. I want a good posture of heart. And one of the best ways that you can do this is in prayer. That's what he says. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing. Prayer is changes the posture of our heart from apprehension and using distractions to meditation and pointing it in the direction of the Lord. So, Bray Hills, have you been distracting or directing your heart lately? How's your prayer life? You've been masking it? been managing it or can you or have you been directing it in posture and in prayer chief fix number two comes to us from philippians 4 8 he says dear brothers and sisters one final thing fix your thoughts just fix them So here's what we tend to do. So he's moving from our heart now to our mind, our thought life. He says, take your thoughts and fix them. Because our tendency is to choose the cheap fix, which is to, f- to let our mind fixate, to let your mind fixate. The natural drift of your mind is to the things you want and the things that you lack. Desires are powerful, Bay Hills. What what are wants? Wants are the things that we perceive that we need in any given moment to bring us joy and flourishing. It's not necessarily sinful. So like, I want a new car. That'll make me happy. That's not sinful. A want becomes sinful when we take a good thing And we make it a God thing. I have to have this to be happy. It becomes sinful when we start caring more about the gifts over the gift giver. So, what do you want? Have you turned that into a God thing? Are you, focus, are you so focused on the gift that you've lost all sight of the giver? 
desires tend to lead us down a road that says, this is what I think God should do to make me happy, which turns him into a genie. If we're not careful. Ezekiel says, your desires are lying to you. They are not in and of themselves the thing that will make you happy. They are deceitful. Desires fall into one of three categories, security, approval, and comfort. Security, I want to be taken care of and not have to worry about my future. Comfort, I don't want to experience pain and discomfort. Or approval, I want to be seen, known, and loved. Those are dis- When you make a good thing a God thing, you are distorting the desire because those three categories are all what make up the gospel. You are secure in Christ. He will never leave you or forsake you. You are approved of because of Christ. He will never leave you and forsake you. He sees you, knows you, and loves you. And your comfort will be once and for all in eternity where there's no pain or suffering. You're trying to make this place heaven again. Or maybe you're not focusing on what you want. Maybe you're focusing on what you lack. It's a little bit different. Instead of this thinking, here's what I think God should do, your heart is doing this. Your mind is doing this. I'm fixating on what God didn't do. Let me ask you a question. Are you right now resentful of the provision that God has given others that he has withheld from you? I mean, if you scroll on social media for 10 seconds, you're going to find out how your heart is. Because in social media, they're only putting their best moments. And so you're scrolling and you're going, oh, they got a new one, huh? That's fine. Oh, oh, married. That's great. I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. A Miata. I knew he was going through a midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, that doesn't mean that I'm resentful. Yeah, it is. You're like, I'm not going to like it. I'm going to withhold my like. I'm going to not like this picture so hard that they're going to know That I don't, in fact, Facebook experimented with the not like button and they were like, oh, we're going to take that off immediately Uh, because people apparently dislike things a lot more than they like things. What's the better investment? Fix your thoughts, Philippians 4, 8, on what is true, on what is honorable, on what is right on what is pure, on what is lovely and admirable. Think about those things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Stop trying, don't let your mind fixate, but be active in fixing your mind on what you need and what you have instead of what you want and what you lack. What's a need? A need is what you actually need for joy and flourishing. And Bay Hills, he never withholds what you need. He never withholds it. He always gives good gifts to his children so that they might have joy and flourishing. Yes, he sometimes withholds what you want. And that might be because it's not time or it's actually not as good for you as you think it is. Focus on what you need and let your thoughts drift to what you have. Romans says it this way. Think about the things that please the spirit. Letting your spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. You know what that's called, Bay Hills? When you focus on what you've been given 
It's called grace. Do you know that we are so conditioned to grace that we can't see it when it's hitting us right in the face? Take a breath. That breath was God's grace. He sustains every one of them. Do you, when was the last time you walked out of your house in the morning and thanked God for the sun coming up? For instead of the lack of health for the parts of your life that do have health. Instead of the lack of money for the way he has taken care of you. When was the last time you, for the lack of a family that you wanted, that you thanked him for, repeat, on repeat the family he has given you? Instead of what's been taken, what's been given. We're so, grace is all around us, and we're so saturated by the grace of God that we become like, it's like normal. We become immune to it. We don't want to recognize it or see it. We become entitled to grace. If he stopped giving grace in any given minute, we would suffocate in this room. Last one. Be content with whatever. Whatever. My generation can be, you ought to thank my generation for the word whatever. My dad, man, my dad hated that word when it left my mouth. Hey, you want to go out? Whatever. Hey, what do you want for dinner? Whatever. Are you going out tonight? Mm, Whatever. Do you love me? Whatever. Boy, I'm going to slap the whatever out of your face right now if you say whatever to me one more time. And I didn't realize how disrespectful that word was until the first time one of my kids said it to me. I was like, my dad, man, he just, it's the language, dad. Like, bro, whatever, bro. Right? I, it's like, it's, you're, you're welcome for such a cool word. And then the first time I looked at one of my kids, it was like, did you clean your room? Whatever. What the crap did you just say to me? How's your life? Whatever. How's your cancer? Whatever. How's your marriage? Whatever. And then it all sort of just becomes whatever. Because the cheap fix that we tend to gravitate towards is to tell ourselves to get over it. get over it until another time, another season, or get over it until the provision changes and I have what I want or need or lack. Hey, some people will be like, hey, tomorrow is a new day. That's my favorite when someone says that to me. Tomorrow, that's a great slogan. Tomorrow is a new day, except our experience tends to be same, different day, right? That's how, we, that's how we actually experience it. And so when somebody comes along and says, hey, hey, tomorrow's a new day. What if it's not? What if they still don't love me? if it still hurts. Whatever. I'll get over it. But you don't. Some of you have been waiting for that new day for so long. You've been whatever for years. Joyless.
Philippians 11, verse 11. I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is a full stomach or empty, whether it's with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. The better investment is not to tell yourself to get over it. It's to ask Jesus to get through it. For one more day. That's why the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 says, Give us this day, today, our daily bread. Matthew 6, verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. God, I have everything that I need to get through one more day. One more minute, one more hour, one more moment, one more season, one day at a time, Lord, when I learn to direct my heart in posture and prayer and when I learn to fix my mind on what I have and what I need, it grounds me in the present tense for one more day. Which brings us back to this little thing. It's cheap. It's a cheap fix. It's not durable. It's not sustainable. It's not enjoyable. Bay Hills, this morning I'm inviting you no more paper plate living. Do the work. Make the better investment. And if you do, you might experience the joy. to find a parking spot I'd rather just pull into a lot who cares about the money spent living in the moment so if it's not convenient if it's just gonna rain on my parade if it adds more work to what made then I'd rather just eat all my meals on a paper plate throw it away oh I never knew no I never knew why I've always been so drawn to plastic I've been so uncomfortable working with what's in these cabinets Oh, I know I've got everything I need, but it's easy to throw cares away. I never knew, I never knew why. I've always preferred paper plates. You, you say I don't how you feel I say your feelings are real but I can't can't find the space to squeeze them in too much in my head now so if it's not relevant 
If it's just gonna get me to think too hard If you're trying to make me put down my guard Then I'd rather just eat all alone on my paper plate Throw it away Oh, I never knew, no, I never knew why I've always been so drawn to plastic I've been so uncomfortable Working with what's in these cabinets Oh, I know I've got everything I need But it's easy to throw cares away I never knew, I never knew why I've always preferred paper plates Throw it away, throw it away, throw it away Responsibility and fight, and my garbage bowl so high. I can't hide from my feelings. I gotta learn to deal with the rainy days. If I don't do the work, I don't get paid. So I'm trying to handle my mind. In a healthy way, throw it away. I never knew, I never knew why. I've always been so drawn to plastic. I've been so uncomfortable cleaning up what's in these cabinets. Oh, I know. Seat. I'm going to put this on my desk. No more cheap fixes because that's, I'm part of the generation called humanity that always drifts to the cheap fix. And I want to invest in my joy. I want to do the work. Bay Hills. Take this home with you. Put it somewhere, even if it's for a little while. First Thessalonians says, always be joyful. And you have everything you need today to go be joyful right now. There's some of you in this room right now that it's time for you to just take a next step with your joy. You've been so whatever for so long, and for the last four weeks, we've been giving you everything you need to have the necessary perspective shift. Wouldn't la last week, during the baptisms, wasn't that great? We had spontaneous, we had people, they just allowed the spirit to get them out of their seat. Six people, like... Right now, the Spirit, I'm, I'm going to ask him to get you up out of your seat. If you know you need a perspective shift in this season with your joy, I'm going to just ask you to stand with us right now. Go ahead. You're not alone. Look around. Let's tell the Lord together how good he is.
I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleasing, that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I love that. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. continue now with worship through the act of giving. And I love what the scripture says about giving. It says this, when you give, the father loves a cheerful giver. And so church, I don't want you to give out of guilt, out of obligation, out of shame because you feel like you have to. I want you to give out of joy. 
Amen. I want you to give out of joy, knowing that this is my opportunity to give back to God what is already his, and that I know he will provide everything that I need to flourish and to have joy. So we're going to continue with this next song in worship, and as we do, we'll do our giving. All right, let's put our hands together. Let's give God praise. He's been amazing. Oh, what an amazing Sunday we've had together here. Come on, let's end it. Let's give him praise. Let's lift our voices and clap our hands if we can. Here we go. Let's sing it. There, there is a river. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean set deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising. for you, but before you go, I want to remind you of one thing. The choice is yours. And I don't know about you, but today I choose joy. We love you, church. We'll see you next week.